Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, opening day is over, and now it's time for the real opening day, the one the Dodgers play on. I am previewing the Dodgers opening series with the Rockies, uh, along with Paul Holden from Locked On Rockies. We're talking about this series, uh, and we're making fun of Alex Bregman a little bit. So, let's get Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Dodger fans. This is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. Or even better, go ahead and subscribe wherever you're watching or listening, and then you'll never miss a day because you know we're not going to. If this is your first time listening or watching, my name is Jeff Snyder. My co-host is Vince Semperio, although it's just me here at the beginning, and then I will be joined by Paul Holden of Locked On Rockies. But Vince and I are both lifelong Dodger fans just like you. We've also both spent time covering the Dodgers in the press box and the locker room, so we're not quite insiders, which is a good thing. But we bring you the smart fans' perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. So again, please subscribe wherever you're watching or listening, and let's talk Dodgers. As I mentioned, uh, today will be a series preview episode uh, with Paul Holden of Locked on Rockies. A couple quick bits of news first. Uh, I thought about just bagging. Uh, Paul and I had a really fun conversation for about a half hour. thought about just throwing that away and just talking about this picture that I'm popping up on the screen right now of Alex Bregman standing next to David Fletcher in the Angels-Astros game. Alex Bregman, who's listed at six feet tall. David Fletcher, who's listed at five foot nine. And they are staring straight into each other's eyes. Uh, but, you know, this is a Dodgers podcast, not a make fun of how insecure Alex Bregman is podcast. So we'll save that for another day. Uh, but a couple bits of news that came out uh, after Paul and I recorded related to the Dodgers. Um, we got the... The, the starting rotation for this weekend, Walker Bueller, we knew was starting opening day. And then in a little bit of a twist, uh, Clayton Kershaw will not be pitching in this series. He will apparently be the Dodgers fourth starter this season. Uh, Tony Gonsolin will start the second game on Saturday. And then Julio Urias will start game three on Sunday. Uh, we didn't get any reasoning for that. Don't know if it was just to keep Kershaw out of Colorado. If it had to do with rest, we don't really know, but that was, uh, some news that we got after Paul and I recorded. The other bit of news that we got was uh, the Dodgers roster, uh, opening day roster. The position players we already knew. The pitching staff was a little bit different than we th thought it might be. Turns out Victor Gonzalez went on the 10-day injured list. Uh, and we haven't heard any details of the injury, how severe it is. Um, but uh, he is on the injured list. So Mitch White is in on uh, in his place on the roster uh, and the Dodgers are carrying 16 pitchers, at least, to start the season. So that's all the news. With that, let's get to my conversation with Paul Holden of Locked on Rockies, previewing this series with the Dodgers and the Rockies. Hope you enjoy it, and uh, thanks for listening. Rock on Rockies fans and Dodgers fans, welcome into a Locked on opening day crossover of two NL West juggernauts, well, at least one. NL West juggernaut and uh, the little brother Colorado Rockies setting up uh, for another opening day matchup against the Dodgers if the against for the Rockies. We are joined by Jeff Snyder here of the Locked On Dodgers podcast. Jeff, how are things? How are you? How do you feel in heading into yet another opening day? Well, now I'm nervous. Which one's the juggernaut? Uh, you know, I think it's the Rockies. I mean, they okay. made the big offseason splash. They they definitely kept their their rotation intact with the, and, and bolstered that bullpen. All things they needed to do, they got it done. And still have Nolan Arenado. So you know, you know yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, you know, funny you say that. Uh, the one authentic Rockies jersey I have. Uh, you know, now two years outdated, but I'm excited nonetheless. It's it's. I think it's actually really exciting that the Rockies are opening the season against the Dodgers. Just not because it's 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 a it's a, oh we want to take a shot early. It's just. This is a good way to look at this new Rockies team. Why not see what what this team has to offer, at least in this beginning part of the season, by going up against uh, a lot of people's World Series favorites? So, uh, Jeff, I'm just curious, as, as you went through the offseason, watching from the outside as the Rockies, I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts were 
looking at your, uh, I don't know if rivals is necessarily the most appropriate term to use given the way the Rockies and the Dodgers have matched up in the last few years. But from the outside perspective, I'm curious your thoughts on the Rockies offseason. You know, it's, uh, it, I guess, confusing is the main word. We talked a little bit about this on our, our big NL West crossover. It seems like even the Rockies didn't totally know what their plan was for the offseason. And, and like, they had a different plan at the end of the offseason than they did at the beginning. Because uh, to go from not even giving John Gray a qualifying offer to signing Chris Bryant to a big mega deal, that feels uh, like multiple personalities or something, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it really does. I mean, it, it truly doesn't. That's that's the biggest sticking point for me. Why? Why did we make all these moves? But John Gray couldn't have been one of them because I'd feel a heck of a lot better about this rotation if John Gray was still there. Yeah, John Gray is a he's a good pitcher. And, you know, there's a decent chance that maybe he would have left anyway. But at least you you get something for him. You know, if you make him the qualifying offer, it was a. You know, as a starting pitcher, if I was a starting pitcher, I would take the first opportunity I had to get out of Colorado. Um, but and that's kind of been the story of the Rockies, you know, franchise history in a lot of ways is we, we can hit. But where are we going to find pitchers who who can pitch here and want to pitch here? But John Gray had had success in Colorado. And uh, yeah, so it, it was a weird one for me. I, I kind of have a question for you. Speaking mm. of pitchers who've had success in Colorado, do you know what the reasoning was for Kyle Freeland starting on opening day over, uh, you know, who everybody knows is the Rockies' best starting pitcher? I honestly, I don't. I really don't have a. I was the. I looked at the spring. I was looking for injury things. I, I didn't look for anything that 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 necessarily uh, points out to why Kyle Freeland was getting the start. My kind of, uh, I don't know if conspiracy theory is the right word, but the Rockies and Kyle Freeland are in contract negotiations right now. They're trying to figure out the future of Kyle Freeland and what better way to try to get the Colorado kid who was drafted by the Rockies to make that person finally get the deal with the developed pitcher to stay in Colorado and be that pitcher. I'm maybe that's there, but but I don't know. I, I don't know why you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, wheel out the all star Ramon Marquez uh, an opening day in front of everyone uh, to to start the season off. I like Kyle Freeland. I'm 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 not necessarily against him getting the start, but it's a big deal. And 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 you know I'm, I am a li- it is weird. There's nothing that I've seen that says this is the for sure reason that Kyle Freeland starts. Uh, maybe there'll be something that'll come out tomorrow. Uh, maybe just to give Vermont an extra day to get into the swing of things. I- I'm not really sure, but I think a lot of people would have liked to see Ramon come out and-, and-, and take on the Dodgers as well. But I'm excited for Kyle Freeland uh, as well, though. That's a- it's a big deal getting the opening day start. Yeah, and Marquez got the opening day start last year. If I remember right, Freeland was hurt at the beginning of the year last year, right? Yes, he got hurt late in the spring last year, and he wasn't able to, and he didn't get into the the rotation until deeper into the season. And that's one of the things, circling back to John Gray, the depth of this starting rotation, if someone is to get hurt at the beginning of this season, the Rockies really take a steep drop-off in terms of their next arms. Even when you get to the fifth spot in the rotation, you're confident in in Marquez, Senzatella, uh, Freeland, and Gomber enough to at least be part of your, your core. But then when you get to that fifth spot, and then with Gomber and Freeland not being necessarily the most consistent pitchers, I, I will say the loss of John Gray really put a blow to that that starting pitching depth for the Rockies as well yeah I remember looking at the Rockies uh depth chart you know their their projected uh starting rotation and and everything and there were some guys on the list who you know probably says more about me than than anything but guys I literally never heard of Mm -hmm. and uh you know I'm sure Rockies fans have heard of these guys but it does seem like they are really really banking on the the guys you know those four guys you mentioned uh, really holding things down and staying healthy, and uh, you know, you know, uh, Marquez and Freeland, and pray for uh, another lockout or something. Yeah, you know, it, it's 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 really that I think that is was the the mindset. It was we are going to bank on these four pitchers keeping us in enough ball games, and hopefully we'll go along for the ride because. 
They really didn't beef up the bullpen. It, it's it's a lot of faith being put in guys that have been that that have been in the system for a little bit. Some of them got some time in the pandemic season. Then they got some time last year. It's young arms, quote unquote, young. Not necessarily. In, it's more young in terms of service time instead of just actual age. But the Rockies really are going to look on on some of their young, their Ryan Rollisons, the Peter Lamberts, names that I know you've never heard of because they came up and and got a couple of hey, starts hey, here. P- at Peter the- Lambert's got some big hits against the Dodgers. I know Peter that's Lambert. true. I, <laughs> that is right. That's right. Uh, rest in peace to the uh, to the to the designated here. And that's actually one thing I am curious, and I want to talk to you uh, about Jeff as well. But before we keep our opening day preview uh, uh, conversation alive, make sure that you are staying up to date and fueled and up to date being up to date with your protein with the best tasting protein bar around and that is built bar built bar has so many delicious flavor options for you available at built.com and they're low calorie high protein and if you don't believe me you can go and check the macro charts for yourself and you're going to be blown away high protein low calorie high fiber low carb most built bars contain 130 calories four grams of sugar four net carbs and 17 grams of protein compare that to a candy bar which usually usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. Hey, if you want to check out something cool and new, you can check out the first ever 100% protein-infused marshmallow. The Built Bar Puffs are there, and both Built Bars and the Built Bar Puffs are covered in 100% real chocolate. Go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. That's 15% off your order with the promo code LOCK15 at Built.com. Promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. We are talking to Jeff here. Jeff from Locked on Dodgers. Jeff, new rule changes, new stuff coming to the uh, world of baseball. What do you think of the DH coming to the National League West and are, is this a big win for the Dodgers? Because in my in my eyes, huge win for the Rockies. As, as much as I think Ramon Marquez is one of the best hitting pitchers in baseball, should have won the Silver Slugger last year. Uh, but uh, I this is a major, major moment for the Rockies because I think they can be a lot more creative with it and we can finally stop having Charlie Blackman play right field when the Rockies finally figure out that that is a bad idea. <laughs> Hey man, you guys just got done letting Charlie Blackman play center field just a year or two ago. So man, <laughs> yeah, you I know, really right? demanding Paul. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, it's a, it's a win for everybody, including every baseball fan. Uh, you know, for example, you're talking about Herman Marquez and what a good hitter he is. Uh, his career OPS plus is 41. I mean, for his career, he is 59% worse than the average hitter, which puts him like, you know, 40, five percent worse than the worst hitting backup shortstop you know and right. that's for me i i grew up a dodger fan a national league fan it's it's in my dna to hate the dh but a couple of years ago i realized you know i pay a lot of money to watch baseball whether i'm at the stadium or you know i'm paying for my mlb tv or whatever it is i'm paying money to watch this when i'm paying money to be entertained i want to watch somebody do something that they're good at and that's what it boils down to for me. I don't want to watch a, a guy go up there and hit who can't hit. And yeah, it's exciting. One of my favorite moments I ever had in the stadium was my first game as a Dodgers season ticket holder, opening day 2013, nothing, nothing game. Dodgers Giants, bottom of the eighth inning, Clayton Kershaw leads off, hits a first pitch home run to break a nothing, nothing tie. Dodgers go on to win four to nothing. Kershaw throws a complete game shutout. It was awesome. Guess what? That one moment does not make up for the 854,963 times I've watched a pitcher go up there and look useless with a bat in his hand. You know, and every pitcher you can name me, Herman Marquez, even last year, should have won the Silver Slugger. His OPS plus was 71. You know, right. like these guys are bad hitters. Stop mm-hmm. making me watch people do things they're bad at. If I want to watch some people talk about Rich Hill, Dodger fans will we'll never get to see Rich Hill run the bases again. The dude sucked at running the bases. If I want to watch somebody look bad running, there's so many YouTube clips of that. There's that episode of Friends where Rachel's embarrassed to go running with Phoebe because Phoebe runs funny. I can watch that anytime I want. I don't need to see Rich Hill run bad. Right. Absolutely. Everyone wants the Bartolo Colon home run where the stadium erupts, oh, like he said. Bartolo, the Clayton Kershaw. Oh, my gosh. That dude was such a bad hitter. Yeah. He's such, he, oh, and the fact that he hit one off. home run. Who cares? People still get excited about that. I'm like, I see that highlight clip. I'm like, 
okay, here's a dude who sucked at hitting for his entire career. And one time he accidentally hit a home run and we act like that makes up for the every other time that he just sucked. And I, I'm not a big on the Bartolo thing. You know, I'm a, as a, as a fellow fat guy, you know, I feel like it's just thinly veiled, make fun of the fat guy, but you know, right. say it in a way that he thinks that we're on his side. You know, you show me a picture of him next to Jacob deGrom and Noah Syndergaard a couple of years ago. And, calling him big sexy like you know what the dude who looks like a toad next to the two guys who actually are sexy don't 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 patronize the fat guy come on yeah no, i i i it, it's definitely there that it, it, and it's a very fair uh, uh uh comparison to say and i i see where you're coming from completely and and, and yeah there's it's it's i'm with you it's it's just it's it, the the approach at the plate, the discipline, the stain, everything. It's just like, ugh. Like it, it is just kind of like, what are we doing? How many baseball fans are immediately turned off uh, by there? Or and I've seen Rymel Tapia hit enough exciting ground balls to, to, you know, that 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 can make up for every dribbler a pitcher will hit through the right side of the. And even Rymel Tapia is a better hitter than her mom Marquez. Yeah, <laughs> right. that's- yeah, exactly. 68 percent on the ground, and you'll still take Tapia over every time. You mentioned Kershaw though. Kershaw coming back, one of the big biggest moves probably for for Dodgers fans this offseason what does it mean uh, for for you to have Kershaw back and what are your expectations for Kershaw this season it, it means everything is a fan you know I Clayton Kershaw is my favorite player of all time I love Clayton Kershaw and mm-hmm. it would have been weird to see him in another uniform I don't think it was ever even though he says it did come down to the Dodgers and Rangers uh, I, I I believe him but I also believe that it was always going to be the Dodgers and you know, the fact that he considered the Rangers, well, yeah, I've considered a lot of things. And then once you look at all the factors, you, you don't do them. And he wasn't going to go to another team. And mm-hmm. I don't believe that he ever will. Uh, but, you know, definitely right now where the Rangers are in the competitive cycle, Clayton Kershaw has been in the league for this will be his 15th season. In those first 14 seasons, he's been in the postseason, I think, 11 times. And, uh, you know, I- including the last nine years, uh, Clayton Kershaw is not looking for October's off. And Mm -hmm. the Rangers, yeah, they're trying to get better. They're still in a tough division. Other teams in their division are trying to get better too. The Rangers are still likely to have October off. And, you know, at Clayton Kershaw's at this stage of his career, he's a competitor. And if he's going to keep playing, he's going to be trying to win. He's not going to, you know, I I honestly believe when Clayton Kershaw is ready to be closer to home, he's going to just be at home. He's not going to be playing for a baseball team in Texas just because that's where he's from. He's going to play to win, play to be competitive until he's done, and then he's going to go be a stay-at-home dad. And yeah. uh, and so it was – of course, he was coming back to the Dodgers. As for what to expect from him, uh, I expect him to be good. He he was – last year when he was healthy, he was very good. And it was the worst season of his career, and he was still very good. Right. And, uh, you know, it, when he's healthy, he's going to be good. The question for the last five or six years with him has been, how many starts are you going to get from him? How healthy mm-hmm. is he going to be? And, you know, we we don't know the answer to that. And I think that's reflected in the contract he signed. I think he was more realistic and basically took a 50% pay cut. He's more realistic about what to expect from himself. And the Dodgers are more realistic about what to expect from him as far as quantity. But quality wise, I think he's going to be really good. Yeah, just just you, you don't doubt Clayton Kershaw when healthy. It's just not something you should do. We've seen him be incredible, one of the best, if not you know at times the best we've we've ever seen. I would say. Is there a, is there any form of a plan that, like to manage? Are they going to just you're in the rotation? We're hoping for the best. Is there going to be any sort of of uh, maybe like a, a start skip every now and then for for Kershaw to, to manage with this uh, with the health concerns? They haven't said anything. Uh... And it's tough to tell because there's so many other question marks around the Dodgers starting rotation. You know, we don't even know if Trevor Bauer is going to be on the team. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you've got the, the top three of Bueller and Urias and, and Kershaw. That's really good. And then you've got uh, Tony Gonsolin, really good stuff. Looked really good in spring has the potential to be a really good starter. And then the fifth starter is up in the air. It's going to start as Andrew Heaney. He's going to get a tryout for three and a half weeks. And then when they realize, oh, he actually is bad, then they'll cut him and Tyler Anderson will slot in unless Trevor Bauer is back. And, you know, but there's so many questions that, you know, you can't really go into the season right now saying, yeah, we're going to do a a six man rotation for a little while, or we're going to skip starts because they don't even know who's going to be their starting five really 
for for the long term. And so right. I'm sure that they've had plenty of talks internally about managing Kershaw's workload. But my guess is that it's going to be more give him, you know, definitely don't skip the fifth starter anytime when you have the day off, you know, let, so that he does get occasional extra days because of built in days off to the schedule. And then beyond that, you know, yeah, he'll probably end up on the injured list for a couple of weeks at some point. And, you know, they, they may be extra aggressive with that. Okay. Here's something where Kershaw could use a start or two off. Boom. Let's 15 day IL him and give him three starts off um, and then bring him back healthy. They may be extra aggressive with that, but, be, but even that, that's just me guessing. Cause they haven't said anything out loud. Mm-hmm. I'm interested. The, the Tyler Anderson pickup could be a, a really nice, it could be a nice, simple, easy ad. I, I watched him. Uh, I, I run the radio board sometimes for, for the Mariners over here. So I got to catch him in, in his stint with the Mariners at the end of the season. And of course the, the, the Rockies ties there as well. A, a nice little piece to add depth to, to that rotation though. Yeah, he is almost exactly a league average starter. I mean, his career ERA plus is 100, you know, and that's very valuable for a fifth starter. You know, a guy who can, especially with the Dodgers offense, a guy who can come in and throw you six innings and allow four runs, you know, that puts you in a really good position to win when you're this Dodgers team. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, um, and and he has potential to even be a little bit better than that, I think. And uh, yeah, Tyler Anderson is a guy, it, it's kind of funny because he was always infuriating when he did pitch for the Dodgers. And I'd be like, it's Tyler Anderson, guys, come on. <laughs> you know, but... But the fact is, you know, you hear you have to say that sentence so many times, you start to realize, okay, maybe Tyler Anderson's not quite as bad as he seems like he should be, you know, because he he doesn't throw very hard, you know, doesn't have great stuff, but he he gets outs, you know, and and that's what you want from a pitcher. And so uh, I I do expect him. I I think he would be the Dodgers fifth starter right now if it wasn't for the fact that they signed Andrew Heaney to a bigger dollar contract. And, you know, Anderson kind of came into camp saying he was willing to pitch in whatever role. And so that kind of gives the Dodgers the opportunity to see if they can fix Andrew Heaney. Uh, But, you know, Tyler Anderson is a really good insurance policy for the very likely possibility that Heaney actually just isn't very good. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And there's one more deal and one more move that uh, we actually didn't get to talk about on the NL West side uh, that in our roundtable that I want to discuss with you. And let's preview this opening day matchup. But before we do, uh, Jeff, I'm curious, did you hop on bet online and get a, and take advantage of some of these future bets that they have? Because I, I, I they have the Rockies at a 68 and a half over under on the on their win total and i was telling people i think you should take the over were there some bets on bet online that 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 you liked for the dodgers you know i uh i'm not a betting man personally but uh i do have fun looking at those odds and and kind of just because it gives you kind of a a feel for the lay of the land on what's expected you know and yeah i i probably would take the over on the rockies at 68 and a half and uh you know the the dodgers i'd take the over on whatever it's at because uh (laughs) those things you know I think the Dodgers are going to be real good. So uh, if I was a betting man, I'd be taking the over on both of these teams. And there's no better place to bet than betonline.net, your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, including uh, the Masters, baseball opening day, and baseball action all season long at BetOnline. BetOnline is your continued source for all your your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action at betonline.net. BetOnline where the game starts. So Jeff, just to, the one thing we didn't get to talk about, I mean, pretty, pretty good, good, another solid move by the Dodgers continuing to beef up, getting, uh, getting uh, Kimbrel there in a deal that happened, I think what, maybe 30 minutes after we finished recording or something like that. Yeah, it was, we finished our it big was shortly uh, after round we recorded table recording. That. Yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was a move that I think it helps both teams. Uh, the White Sox needed an outfielder, AJ Pollock, you know, it seems to me from a Dodger standpoint, Dodgers are kind of selling high on AJ Pollock. He's had basically the two best seasons of his career in 2020 and 2021. Uh, And, you know, he's 34 years old. He's in the last year of his contract. He's probably going to take a step backwards this year offensively. Um, Cause there were times even last year, he, his overall numbers looked pretty darn good, but that was a really, really hot stretch for about the whole month of July. And, uh, and then, you know, he was 
kind of bad against righties for a lot of the season. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's sad to see AJ, AJ Pollock go. From a personal standpoint, everybody likes AJ Pollock. You know, everybody's sad to see him go, his teammates and the fans. Uh, sure. But, you know, the Dodgers sold high on, on Pollock, and in some ways they bought low on Kimbrell because Kimbrell was really bad with the White Sox last year after he got traded from the Cubs. And, you know, there's a reason. They, they call this a high-risk, high-reward kind of deal with Kimbrell. But, you know, people think about the high reward and they forget the first half of that equation is the high risk, you know, and there's a chance that Craig Kimbrell will struggle and, and this trade could look bad. But if they can get him back to the version of Craig Kimbrell that the Cubs had in the first half of last season or, you know, the the elite Craig, Craig Kimbrell of the past, it really solidifies that Dodgers bullpen and puts them in a position to be able to uh, utilize their other relievers in – in a more predictable way uh, for the relievers, put, put them in roles they're comfortable with. You know, Blake Trinan, it, I, I was excited about the idea of the Dodgers going with closer by committee. Uh, but now that they have a closer, I'm maybe even more excited about them going with innings six through eight by committee, you know, play those matchups and then have Kimbrell come in and do what he's comfortable with, knowing he, he can get out lefties or righties. And, you know, so we will get to see Blake Trinan in either the sixth, seventh, or eighth inning, depending on when the tough part of the lineup's coming up, get to see Alex Vesia against some lefties, you know, and 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 the Dodgers have a lot of really good relievers, and I think Kimbrel just adds to that and kind of solidifies their their bullpen plan. So I'm pretty excited about it. And it kind of I, I, it softens the blow maybe of losing Jansen a little bit as well. You have someone at least in kind of name recognition for out of the bullpen. You kind of get that as well with with, with Kimbrel coming in with, with Jansen moving on there as well. Yeah, and you know there's only one active player in baseball with more career saves than Kenley Jansen, and that's Craig Kimbrel. You yeah. know, and at at his best, Craig Kimbrel is better than Kenley Jansen, uh, mm -hmm. especially you know, at this point of Jansen's career. Jansen had a pretty solid year last year. Uh, other than, you know, he had a couple high profile, like three straight blown saves in a row mid season, including two against the giants that came back to hurt. Uh, mm -hmm. but you know, after that, that stretch of games, Jansen was, was lights out the rest of the season. He, I think he had set was 17 for 17 and save opportunities had an ERA right around one. He was really, really good. Uh, but just pure skills wise right now, I'd take Kimbrell over Jansen and, uh, especially when you look at, at the contract and everything, you know, what, what the Dodgers are paying, you know, I think Kimbrell is a little bit better pitcher than Kenley Jansen. And so it, it's, it's an upgrade overall in the closer department. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it, it's a, another solid move. Another one that makes a makes total sense. The Dodgers are, 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 are great at also taking players when they get an opportunity to bring a player in from other teams uh, can, can really revitalize them. We've, how many times have we seen that uh, from, from Rockies, no names that go. And uh, is it, uh, is it you or, 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 uh, or Vince that always tweets out about uh, Chris Taylor from the, uh, from uh, the Mariners every time he does something good. Yeah, that that's Vince. That's Vince's uh, his shtick. The, Dodgers acquired Chris Taylor in exchange for Zach Lee. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it works for Vince. He's made t-shirts out of it. So that, that's his <laughs> brand. Uh, but speaking so, of no name Rockies, I got a question yeah. for you. Uh, Chris course. Bryant, that's a dude with a name yeah. and it's a name that we haven't said yet on this episode. And I feel like we should, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on the Chris Bryant signing? I, you know, it, it, I, it doesn't answer the questions of why it doesn't answer. Why not Nolan Arenado, Trevor story. Uh, it doesn't it fix that, but this is the Rockies trying to create a new era of Rockies baseball. It's a long deal. I hope he plays for the whole thing. I'm not necessarily thrilled on him being a, a left fielder and a tough to play outfield, but I think he's going to mash. I think he's going to hit the ball really well. And if things don't go well in the outfield, maybe in a couple of years can, and can figure out maybe something in, in a first base or even in a, a really, really efficient DH thing. I think the Rockies having a star name was good for the brand of the Rockies. Cause I don't think that Dick Momfort really wanted to go into his first season Honestly, really ever without a star player name, the Rockies might be bad, but they still had recognizable names. But no one in the wide world of baseball is really going to be talking a ton about Ryan McMahon and Brendan Rodgers if that, you know, without Chris Bryant being in that sentence as well. So I think that was a big move to be made for the Rockies. 
it's a big commitment. I would have liked maybe a little less time, but uh, I'm I'm I, I'm okay with it, and I'm all right with embracing this new era. It doesn't necessarily make sense in the big picture. No, I still think you would be in a more competitive, better chance to win if your team still consisted of Arenado, Story, Gray, and Lemayhew when you were in the playoffs. But I do like the fact that the Rockies got the got one of the biggest fishes in the free march uh, the free agent market pool this year uh made other moves uh, and i'm really excited to see what he's going to do i think he's going to be someone that i i do i do i am a person that values that leadership and experience i think him coming from the team that that broke the curse in chicago and uh and being a part of a team that and and, and winning a world series and being one of the top names in baseball is going to be a benefit but it's going to take a heck of a lot more than chris bryant i i, I think that there was the to be, a, we're going to get Trevor Story level of offense from Chris Bryant. Are we going to get Trevor Story level of defense? You know, in, I know you can't exchange it one to one in the outfield, but in just in terms of production, no, I don't think so. But um, I, I, I like the move. I'm still hesitant, but uh, I, I'm glad the Rockies were the most active they've been in this this off season. And it sounded like last year that that Dick Momfort was a little bit more involved with his trade by committee and things. So still to do this stuff to get to this Chris Bryant thing, I don't love it's it's again. Why isn't John Gray on the team? Like uh, that simply really doesn't make a lot of sense if you didn't trade him or do the qualifying offer. Um, you know, are and and now if you look at the starting rotation depth, if you're going to spend all that money on Bryant, why couldn't you have have, have made it? You know, could you have made deals elsewhere to bring in uh, instead of going all in on Bryant? Could you have gotten a uh, Schwarber and 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 a, and a better shortstop than Jose Iglesias to come in and play and, and get that sort of production. So there's still a lot of what ifs, but I, I like the deal overall, but I'm still really hesitant. Yeah. If uh, on a day when you got Bryant playing left and, and Blackman playing right, it's a really good thing that Garrett Hampson's fast because uh, yes. he's going to have to cover a lot of ground in that outfield. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. It's, it's just, we need, defense in out in the outfield of course field is 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 so important so so important so if he struggles in left and the rockies are continually going to sit there and say we got to have charlie blackman playing right field for whatever reason yeah they, they need to use that speed because and and if you're in that situation that limits who you can use you're more likely to use hampson and daza to cover up that the, the you know to the speed and the better defense, but Hampson and Daza are way worse options for your offense than uh, you know your newly acquired uh, uh, Grichik and uh, your your Sam Hilliard, for example. So the Rockies are 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 so the center field is is something I'm I'm definitely worried about. And then the other thing too, Jose Iglesias has a name, but that defense was rough last year really rough for 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 uh for him so i'm hoping i'm hoping the 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 you know the the dirt that tulo and story left behind can can help bring some uh, some new life into him but uh yeah i i i i that the that outfield does worry me a little bit but i think the rockies will score more this year with that outfield and chris bryan i think is going to lead lead the way in terms of rockies offense because i was really worried going into the rockies big bat was just going to be cj crone it's like i love cj crone i think that's honestly been one of the best moves the rockies have made in the past couple of years but to just say cj crone is our keystone offensive piece you're not going to be feeling overly confident about your offense now with Chris Bryant and hopefully bumps an offense from Rogers and McMahon with Crone. I think that's going to be something that that's a little bit more formidable to, to, to take on the NL West. I, I still, still think there's work to be done to, to reach that first and second spot in the division though. Yeah. CJ Crone was on the last angels team to make the postseason. I've always said, you know, you can have as many Mike Trask and Shohei Otani's as you want, but you're not going to make the postseason without CJ Crone, you know? The Rockies needed CJ Crone. I mean, in game one, if, if the Rockies in 17 and 18 had CJ Crone, uh, who knows what necessarily could happen? I'm not saying it's World Series or bust, but I'm just saying the Rockies have a a, a, a utility player in the middle of there of the of the order that can score. That wasn't one of their key pieces. Something they desperately needed. If CJ Crone was on the Rockies a couple years earlier, it could have been. A much different story. But Jeff, before we, we wind things down, just your couple of things you're looking for this opening day, this opening series. What are you hoping to see from 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 the Dodgers this opening set against the Rockies? Just kind of your brief things, because it's early. I mean, it's the first series of the year. How much are we truly going to learn, especially with all this, uh, you know, all this hype around the Dodgers? Yeah, you know, I don't think we're going to learn a ton, at least in part because 
there's only, you know, from a Dodger standpoint, there's only so much you can learn from a series in Colorado. You know, mm-hmm. I, my big mantra is always don't get too excited about anything good that happens in Colorado and definitely don't get too upset about any bad pitching that happens in Colorado because, you know, it, it's a, it's a weird place for baseball. And, yeah. and so, uh, but what I'm excited to see is just this lineup actually playing together. You know, we, mm-hmm. Their game on Tuesday against the Angels, their last spring training game, was really the first time all spring that we've seen what's likely to be their main starting nine in the lineup together. And it it worked out beautifully. You know, you had uh, Trey Turner driving in Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman on a double. You had Max Muncy driving in Freddie Freeman on a double, you know, and you it's, uh, you know, seeing what this lineup can do together. uh, Obviously, one of the big storylines for us is will Cody Bellinger remember how to hit? Because uh, he he looked terrible, terrible for most of this spring. He didn't strike out at all in the last few games of the spring. And so hopefully that's a sign that he's starting to get things figured out with his new swing, which is, you know, I think, swing number 841 of his career. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but that's going to be a huge storyline. And, you know, and then there's just, you know, is Mookie totally back healthy? Is, you know, there there's so many... Uh, we, we talk about playing the game on paper, you know, the Dodgers on paper are the best team in, in baseball and right. definitely the best in the national league. Uh, but you know, they don't play on paper. And so for me, the thing I'm most excited about, about opening day, opening weekend is that we get actual games actually happening. So we don't have to talk about on paper anymore. We can actually say, Hey, look, this guy did this thing in a game that counts in the standings. And I honestly, I'm going to echo that. I I know it's <laughs> my my lineup of of Bryant and Rogers, McMahon and Crone doesn't have the same firepower as uh, Turner and <laughs> Betts and uh, Bellinger and, and such. But this is and again all the confusion, all the questions, all the stuff about the Rockies. Now we can finally start seeing this new look, new identity Rockies, led by Bill Schmidt and his plan for a Rockies offense that hopefully should score more runs. But will the bullpen? You know, the bullpen didn't really get much better from last year How, what's that going to look like what's this what's the rocky starting rotation going to be like without john gray and uh, you know they're going to see because it all starts uh today of uh, your opening pitch first pitch opening pitch i, I got it it's not related but i will say pretty excited about the person throwing out the first pitch uh, to, to kick off the rocky season who this is year. it it's, it's russell wilson oh i've heard of that guy rocky's legend you know russell wilson drafted by the rockies now I'm going to, you know, a lot more, <laughs> a lot more uh, excitement to be coming from the rest of the season. Uh, Jeff, where can people go to stay up to date with all things you and, and, and all things Dodgers? Yeah. So locked on Dodgers, just like locked on Rockies is available every weekday. You know, we drop it by about 1 a.m. Pacific every weekday morning. And so by the time you're driving to work, you can check it out there. I'm on Twitter at Snydog. My co-host, Vince Samperio, he's on Twitter at Vince Samperio. If you want tweets about Chris Taylor being traded for Zach Lee uh, and and other stuff too. And uh, yeah. So, you know, if you're interested in hearing us talk about the Dodgers, we're available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. And we over here are at uh, locked on Rockies, LO Rockies on Twitter, Paul of Holden on the uh, Twitter sphere as well. Uh, We'll be talking Rockies. And I'm sure this won't be the last time that you hear Jeff and I, uh, uh, you know, talking throughout the season, but make sure you go uh, and support locked out locked on Dodgers. You can support us on Locked On Rockies. It's going to be a ton of fun this weekend, Jeff. Thank you so much. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, Paul. All right, that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you uh, to Paul for uh, hosting that and for taking the time to talk with me about this series. Thank you to all of you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. We really appreciate it. Uh, For your second listen, check out Locked On MLB. Paul Francis Sullivan, please call him Sully. Uh, brings you his unique look at the major leagues past and present, and it's free and available wherever you get podcasts. That's a good second listen for today. Uh, if you're not watching or listening to Locked on Dodgers every day, please add one or two days a month to your rotation. If you have friends or family who might like it, please tell them about it. You can follow us on Instagram and on Twitter at Locked on Dodgers. Vince is on Twitter at Vince Semperio. I'm on Twitter at Snydog. DMs are open in all of those places. You can email us at LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com. Or you can leave us a voicemail or a text at 323-863-LOCK-5625. 
We are here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. We'll talk to you on Monday. Go Dodgers.